Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, welcome. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the story of the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders, a series of unsolved murders that took place in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa in North Bay, California in the early 1970s. Yep, another serial killer active in California in the 70s and another one who has remained unidentified. Whoever was responsible for these murders has never been caught and punished for them, but there is still a chance, there's always a chance. This era was somewhat of a heyday for serial killers. I actually found a fascinating article about this on Rolling Stone, which brings up some interesting points as to why this may have been, especially as numbers of serial killers have really been on the decline since the 2000s. The 70s was a time in which a lot of serial killers will either have been born during wartime or their fathers would have been returning from the war with PTSD and the potential to have violent outbursts. If you're already predisposed to the personality and compulsion of a serial killer, a volatile childhood really has the potential to unlock that. Most serial killers hit their peak crimes in their 20s, so the timing works out well there for the children of war veterans. And then of course also, as time went on, people became more aware of personal safety, hitchhiking declined, technology increased with cameras everywhere, and phones which detect our every move. It became more difficult for people to go and kill undetected. Not impossible of course, it still happens, but certainly difficult. But anyway, I digress, I was too interesting not to share about why there were so many serial killers in the 70s. I'll share the article in the description box just in case anyone fancies reading it. The Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders happened at a time in California when the Golden State Killer, Joseph D'Angelo, was operating as the Visalia Ransacker. The still unidentified Zodiac Killer had just gone quiet. A state away, Ted Bundy was about to start his crimes. There were the Hillside Stranglers, Charles Manson, although I'd always get shouted out when I call him a serial killer, and later the Grim Sleeper and Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And the Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murderer, who is thought to have at least seven victims, potentially eight, and probably more. The horror began with two young girls, 12-year-old Maureen Sterling and 13-year-old Yvonne Weber, friends who were middle school students at Herbert Slater Junior High in Santa Rosa. Yvonne had only just had her 13th birthday less than a week prior and Maureen's was coming up in less than two weeks time. They were last seen alive on the 4th of February 1972 after they'd been dropped off by Maureen's mother at the Redwood Empire Ice Arena which is just across the street from Coddingtown Mall. I'm sure the girls told their parents they were just going skating at the arena, but it seems that they actually had other plans and ended up going elsewhere. I couldn't find any clear answer on the internet as to where they went after this point. I did see one source mentioning they possibly went to hang out at a local park with some older boys, who were later polygraphed and found to know nothing, but do take that with a pinch of salt as I was unable to confirm that for certain. When Maureen's mother later returned to pick the girls up at 11pm as organised, they were nowhere to be seen. According to authorities, they were last seen getting into a car on Guerneville Road, either voluntarily or forcefully. This road runs between the ice arena and the mall. A 16-year-old male also reportedly saw them around 9pm. It seems the police may have at first entertained the idea that the girls ran away, but their parents disagreed with this. They suspected from the get-go that they had tried to hitchhike. This is interesting because if they had a lift home organised for 11pm, why would the girls be hitchhiking anywhere? Maybe they wanted to go home earlier, but maybe they were going somewhere else entirely and intended to get back to the arena in time for pickup. Or maybe whoever's car they were seen getting into was just very persuasive. But that was it, Maureen and Yvonne just disappeared. This was in the February and their remains weren't found till the 28th of December 1972, almost 11 months later. They were discovered at about 4pm that day by two teenage boys who were hiking in the Franz Valley Hills. 
The boys went home and told their parents what they found, who soon reported it to the police. They spotted one skull as they were climbing a steep embankment to reach the country road at the top. It was 2.2 miles north of Porter Creek Road on Franz Valley Road, about 66 feet east of the roadway on a steep hillside. It was 16 miles from where the girls had last been seen. The remains are described in the reports from the time as being bones only, and it was speculated early on that the remains were of two young women. It was clearly not two adults, and it was speculated from the get-go to be Yvonne and Maureen. A few days later, the remains were confirmed to be them, identified through their dental charts. Investigators obviously scoured the crime scene for any clues, and they did find two things of significance. Close to where one of the girl's skulls lay, they found a patch of human hair and an earring, a circular piece of gold or brass with a filigree lace-like pattern, from which several clear or orange beads were hanging. They also found another piece of jewellery directly above one of the skulls, a thin gold chain necklace with its clasp broken off and a gold cross. As well as the dental records, Maureen's mother identified the necklace as belonging to her daughter. Interestingly, not a single piece of clothing was found at the scene, not a single piece of fabric. Due to the level of decomposition, there was no cause of death to be found. By the time Yvonne and Maureen's remains were found, there had become a bit of a pattern in Santa Rosa. Two other girls had also gone missing and had been subsequently found in very similar circumstances. After Yvonne and Maureen's discovery, the sheriff said that although there was no direct evidence of homicide, his office was going to do a total investigation. I mean, surely by this point they would have already linked their case to the two other girls, but I'm not really sure. As I said before, investigators were never that interested in searching for Maureen and Yvonne whilst they were missing, because they always thought they were just runaways, despite their parents' protest. I'm sure this looks very, very bad on them. Just one month after this first disappearance, on the 4th of March 1972, 19-year-old Santa Rosa Junior College art student Kim Allen disappeared after leaving her shift at Larkspur Natural Foods, which is a health food store. In a very strange twist, Kim actually lived at 2298 Gurnville Road with roommates, the very same road on which Yvonne and Maureen were last seen getting into a car. Now, in and around Sonoma County, people hitchhiked on a daily basis. With no cars of their own and reportedly poor public transport, a lot of people felt it was easier to just grab lifts off of random people. Kim hitchhiked to and from work every single week. I find it hard to understand this mindset being a child of the 90s, but so many people back in the 70s didn't even have a second thought before getting into random cars. Of course, the majority of people aren't going to harm you, but there's always the one that will, as Kim Allen sadly found out. In Sonoma County alone, they had more than 100 rapes reported in 1971, and about 80% of those involved hitchhiking, and that's just the ones that have been reported. Despite her mother and teachers warning her of the dangers of hitchhiking, Kim always wanted to see the best in people. Her mum later said to a newspaper, She was never a speck of trouble to anyone from the day she came on this earth. She trusted everyone, she believed that people were good. And one of her teachers described her as having an air of innocence. Now sometimes hitchhiking isn't as easy as just getting into a car and then taking you to where you need to go. If the person wasn't headed to your destination, they could drop you as close as they could and then you would try and grab another lift from there, which is what it seems happened in Kim's case. The first people that Kim got a lift with that day later told sheriff's officers that they let her out at a northbound on-ramp at Bell Avenue in Highway 101 in San Rafael about 5.30pm that day. That was the last time she was seen, apart from by the person who killed her. She was wearing, or at least had with her that day, a three-quarter length coat, a gold plastic beret, blue jeans, an ankle length blue skirt with flower pattern, a blue straw bag, an oval turquoise ring, a green cloth shoulder bag, and she was carrying an aluminium frame backpack. 
as well as carrying a large wooden soy sauce barrel that was labelled with red Chinese characters. She was literally just carrying a wooden barrel down the road. You'd think this barrel would make her fairly distinctive, you'd notice someone walking down the street carrying that. Apparently she planned to make it into a drum. A small mercy for Kim's family is that she wasn't missing for too long. Her body was found the very next day by two high school students on the 5th of March 1972. She was discovered completely nude in a creek bank off of Enterprise Road about 8 miles southeast of Santa Rosa. There was a steep drop down to the embankment where the body was found. At first the students thought the body was a mannequin but of course in stories like this it's never a mannequin. They reported the body to the sheriff's office at 2.05pm that day. It took a while to identify the body as Kim Allen because she wasn't reported as missing immediately, remember she was found the very next day. She was eventually identified by her sister after a first tentative identification of a photograph by her roommates. But even before she was identified, investigators had a good idea of her death. The pathologist's report showed that she died around midnight on Saturday and it was not a quick, merciful death. It would have been very slow as she was slowly strangled by a cord or wire wrapped around her neck for at least half an hour before she died from asphyxiation. And she was raped. Semen was found on the body as well as an oily substance being found on her right side. This was identified as being similar to the oil used in a machine shop for cutting metal. They also found evidence of her having been bound at both her wrists and ankles. There was nothing found at the scene, no clothing or personal property, except for a single gold hoop earring. The soy barrel has never been found, although don't forget about that, I will be coming back round to it later in this video. Kim's body was covered in scratches, likely not from her ordeal, but instead from where she'd rolled down the embankment. She was given no dignity in her death and it's thought that her killer simply stopped their car on the road and threw her body over the embankment. It was suspected by investigators that whoever left her body there may have actually slightly slipped and fallen down the hill, as demonstrated by a mark in the ground. About 10 feet below that spot, there was an impression in the ground about a foot long and 14 inches deep that may have been left by a person's leg. There's a chance that the killer may have hurt themselves in the process, broken a leg, or had another injury serious enough to have required medical treatment. Kim's aluminium frame backpack was actually found several weeks later, and the personal checkbook she was carrying was deposited in a drive-up mailbox across from Kempfield Post Office at some point on the morning of the 24th of March. Two fingerprints found on the checkbook may belong to the killer. After Kim, a 20 year old woman called Jeanette Kamahel or Kamaheli, I've heard it pronounced both ways, went missing on the 25th of April 1972. She's never been found. Jeanette was a 5 foot 5 female, 120 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. She has a large birthmark underneath her right breast. Sources do tend to differ as to her race. Charlie Project says she was a Pacific Islander of Hawaiian descent, whereas Medium states that she was Japanese Hawaiian, and the California Department of Justice just says that she is other Asian. Jeanette was last seen attempting to hitch a ride on Highway 101 from Katati, California to Santa Rosa Junior College, but she never made it. The Press Democrat reported at the time that a witness saw her getting into a 1950 to 1952 pickup truck fitted with a faded brown homemade wooden camper covered with roofing shakes. The driver was apparently a white male, 20 to 23 years old, with afro style hair. As Jeanette's body has never been found, it was never able to be confirmed if she was a victim of foul play, but they do assume that's the case. As she disappeared from the same area as the rest, seen getting into a man's car, she's likely also a victim of the same killer. As a result of both Jeanette and Kim's disappearances, the local Sonoma State College set up a carpool system, so female students would no longer be tempted to hitchhike. 
The carpools advertised on the school bulletin board along with emergency numbers to contact if you were stuck and a list of alleged assailants and their cars. If you had a bad situation whilst hitchhiking, you could warn other people via this list and I'm sure it did save many people getting into sticky situations. On the 11th of November 1972, 13-year-old Laura Lee Cursor, an 8th grade student at Cook Junior High School, was reported missing by her mother. She disappeared whilst they were shopping together at a U-Save. At this point, Laurie was wearing blue jeans, a brown leather jacket and brown suede cowboy boots. But Laurie was a habitual runaway. At the time her mum reported her as missing, she really had just run away it seems and had gone to live with friends in the Santa Rosa area. She was last seen by these friends on either November 20th or 21st, around 5.30 to 6pm. With Laurie's free travelling nature, it could be that this is truly when she was taken, or it could be that she travelled to see friends elsewhere. Although, if she is to match the killer Zemo in this case, she likely would have disappeared from Santa Rosa. One article from the Press Democrat notes that she was seen by a witness who knew her on November 26th at the Rose Bowl in Santa Rosa, wearing the same clothes she was last seen by her mother. So her date of disappearance is a little bit questioned. But on the 14th of December, Laurie's body was found by a young couple in a ravine about 50 foot away from Calistoga Road on the outskirts of Santa Rosa. Similar to Kim, it took a few days for Laurie to be positively identified, although she eventually was through dental records and a positive ID by her dentist. The autopsy revealed that Laurie had died at some point between the 1st and 8th of December, but her body was in fairly good condition due to the extreme cold California had been experiencing. Her cause of death was dislocation of her first and second cervical vertebra, with compression and hemorrhage of the spinal cord due to trauma. Essentially, her cause of death was a broken neck, another horrible way to go, although hopefully it was instant she had not been sexually assaulted. Once again, there was no clothing or personal property found at the scene, but they did find her body with two wire loops through her pierced ears, but no actual earrings attached. Later, a potential witness came forward saying that on an evening at some point between the 3rd and 9th of December, he had seen two men push a girl fitting Laurie's description into the back of a van on Pankhurst Drive. The van then sped north and was driven by a Caucasian man with Afro-type hair. If you remember, Jeanette may have also been last seen getting into a car driven by a man of similar description. Although it is worth bearing in mind that whilst white men with Afro-style hair is more unusual today, it was somewhat of a fashion in the 70s. The van was white with an off-colour door, possibly grey, on the driver's side, and it seemed that the two men were walking either side of the girl, holding her up and leading her. They almost ran across the intersection with her, they were desperate to get her into the van. Two weeks after Laurie's discovery, Maureen and Yvonne's bodies would be found, finally. But before this point, after the discovery of Laurie, the Press Democrat joined with two local radio stations and some public spirited groups to set up a fund to encourage people to come forward to volunteer information anonymously about Laurie and Kim's case. It was a campaign called Secret Witness. It wasn't the first of its kind, it seems it had begun in Detroit in 1967 and had led to the city solving 14 murders and 45 felonies in its first year. People were encouraged to print or type any information they had about these cases in a letter and not sign their name. Instead, they were to sign with a code number containing any combination they chose of three numbers and three letters putting the code in each bottom corner of the last page of the letter, before tearing off one of the corners and keeping it. The rest of the letter was then to be sent to the secret witness PO box in Santa Rosa. If the information provided in your letter led to the arrest and conviction of the killer of Laurie or Kim and then later the other victims, then the code and torn page could be used to arrange a reward payment of $500. 
Soon, members of the public started sending in their donations to help with the secret witness fund, and big companies were contacted to raise additional money. They hoped to be able to expand the rewards to other major crimes in the area, like burglaries and bank robberies, as well as murders. By 1974, the campaign was offering $1,000 rewards for any information about the deaths of Maureen and Yvonne, Kim and Laurie, and $500 for Jeanette. The tips did come flying in, but clearly nothing ever led to an arrest or solving of this case. Clearly by this point, all of their cases had been linked, and they knew they were dealing with a serial killer. The next victim was 15-year-old Caroline Davis, or sometimes called Carolyn who ran away from home just outside Anderson in Shasta County on February 6, 1963. She was reported as missing by her parents on the day she disappeared, but they soon received a letter from her saying that she'd left on purpose and had no intention of returning. She was simply tired of living at home. In the months she was on the move, she was traced as far away as Illinois and New Mexico, but was last seen around 1.30pm on July 15th in Garberville, California, which is about 172 miles north of Santa Rosa, just over a two and a half hour drive. She was actually last seen by her grandmother, who left her in front of a post office to hitch a ride south on 101 towards Modesto. The 101 passes directly through Santa Rosa. Perhaps whoever picked Caroline up could only take her as far as Santa Rosa, so maybe she got dropped off there and picked up another lift, this time from the killer. But there's no way of knowing for sure. She is believed to have died around the 20th of July, so five days after her grandmother last saw her. Her body was found on the 31st of July off Franz Valley Road, north of Santa Rosa less than four feet away from where the bodies of Maureen and Yvonne had been found seven months earlier. Her body was only discovered as a passing motorcyclist stopped because he could smell something foul. Once again, it was difficult to identify Caroline and until they found out who she was, there was only so far they could take the investigation and trace her last movements. Her body wasn't discovered in the best condition. She is thought to have been decomposing for just under two weeks, so identification via her facial features was impossible and the viability of fingerprints was dubious. Any investigation was balancing on her dental chart, which the Sheriff's Office prepared and circulated locally and statewide, hoping a dentist would be able to match it to one of their records. Apparently she had a normal set of teeth, apart from an unusual crossbite position of one of her molars, something which would be recognisable to a dentist. And it was indeed a dentist who eventually identified Caroline, but only after her sister read about the search for the victim's identity. She called the sheriff's office to inquire and forwarded a copy of her sister's dental chart and a dentist confirmed from there. The sheriff said to the paper that she was probably a victim of the same person or persons who killed Yvonne and Maureen the year before. It was impossible to tell if she'd been sexually assaulted. As with the rest of the victims, there was no clothing or personal belongings found at the scene, nor even any jewellery this time. Interestingly, she did have a hole in her right earlobe similar to a piercing hole, but she did not have the same in her left. If the killer is taking just one earring as a trophy of sorts, if Caroline only had one ear pierce, then this earring is probably the one that he took. Finding the cause of death for Caroline was not simple and it took a long time. I think early on, lab technicians were able to tell that there was an unidentified substance found in her bloodstream that was likely the cause of death. However, they struggled to identify the exact substance. They did say that all of the evidence at that point in the game showed a considerable amount of premeditation on behalf of the killer. Eventually, it was confirmed that she had died from strychnine poisoning. They were unable to identify the exact type of strychnine used, narrowing it down to either sulfate or tablet form. The autopsy indicated that it could have been administered to Caroline in either oral or intravenous form, and it had not been mixed with any other drugs. This is a different cause of death than any of the other girls. So far you've had poisoning, you've had a broken neck, and you've had strangulation and asphyxiation. 
secret witness offered $2,500 for any information leading to a conviction in Caroline's case. Investigators would also later say that a witchcraft symbol was found close to Caroline's body, on the road above the site where she was found. This symbol was reportedly made out of twigs, a rectangle connected to a square with bars running along the side. The symbol was thought to be an occult symbol which dated back to medieval England, meaning carrier of spirits, perhaps as some form of protection. Some sources suggest that the symbol was found at other sites as well, but I couldn't find any concrete information on that, so I'm not sure that it was. The sheriff said that the person who left this symbol there was perhaps a believer in witchcraft, perhaps believing that his victims would serve him in the afterlife. Or perhaps the symbol had nothing to do with Caroline, maybe it was coincidence. Then on the 22nd of December 1973, there was the disappearance of 23 year old Teresa Walsh, although a lot of sources also refer to her as Therese. She was last seen in Zuma Beach near Malibu, where friends say they left her to hitchhike to Garberville to spend Christmas with her parents and son although her mum had actually reported her missing already on December 13th, presumably after she left home with no explanation. Her body was found just six days after her friends last saw her in Mark West Creek in northeast Santa Rosa. Her body was found by two young adults kayaking in the creek. She was half submerged under a log about half a mile from Michelle Way and Mark West Springs Road. Teresa had been hogtied with her arms and legs bound against her chest with a thin piece of clothesline rope. Her thumbs had also been tied together. The area had recently experienced heavy rainfall, so it's speculated that her body could have drifted for several miles before it was found, and it's thought that she was not dumped where she was discovered. Officials say that she had likely died about a week before she was found, so probably only hours after she was last seen by her friends. The pathologist determined that the cause of death was strangulation, but a severe blow to the back of the head was a possible contributing cause. Once again, identifying her took a few days, but it wasn't too difficult, as all of her upper teeth were false and she had a gold crown on the lower right side of her mouth. She was identified through fingerprints and dental records. Once again, silent witness offered a $1,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest and conviction. The final official victim of the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murderer has sadly never been identified and she remains a Jane Doe. Her skeletal remains were not found until the 2nd of July 1979, five and a half years after Teresa was discovered. Once again, she was found by hikers and was found in a spot incredibly close to where Laurie Cursor had been found seven years earlier in Rincon Valley. Evidence showed that Jane Doe had been hogtied with a rope around her neck, feet and hands, very similar to Teresa Walsh. The cord was thought to be a clothesline or a Venetian blind cord, and they also found grommets and pieces of fabric that indicated that the body may have been placed in a duffel or laundry bag before it was dumped. It was even suggested that she may have been alive when the killer threw her down the embankment, as the ropes were tied unusually tight, as if to prevent her from moving. Forensic examination showed that the body had been there around seven years, meaning that she likely died at some point in the midst of the serial murders and just took years to be found. Which poses the question, how many more undiscovered victims were there? She fell into the approximate age group of the rest of the victims. Investigators literally scoured the hillside with tweezers, examining each shovelful of dirt and rocks to ensure nothing was missed. As a result, they found several teeth and a hard contact lens kept in a metal tin. As hard contact lenses became less popular after the mid 70s when soft lenses came in, this matches with the timeline investigators had. Whilst they thought that the lens may have been vital in identifying the victim, clearly they've never been able to. It was also found that the victim had had a broken rib at some point in their life, a break which had fully healed. They found several samples of reddish or auburn hair, as well as fragments of what appeared to be brown thread. 
There were no weapons found at the scene, nor any signs of clothing. Jane Doe was five foot three. They did compare her dental records to those of Jeanette, but it was not a match. This was another separate victim. Whilst Jane Doe is the final discovered victim, there are other people who are suspected to maybe have fallen victim to the hitchhiker murderer. 17-year-old Lisa Smith was last seen hitchhiking on Hearn Avenue in Santa Rosa and has never been heard from since. Although the situation around her disappearance is complicated and all records relating to her case seem to have just disappeared. 15-year-old Kerry Graham and 14-year-old Francine Trimble disappeared in mid-December 1978, so a few years after the murder went quiet, or as far as we know. Their skeletal remains were found the following July, but they weren't actually positively identified until 2015. They told their friends that they had plans to hitchhike to a party in Santa Rosa, but they didn't say whose party it was, and then they just disappeared. Kerry had a habit of running away and staying with friends, so when she disappeared, her family weren't immediately concerned. In fact, she wasn't officially reported missing for decades. It was always believed that they were just runaways. They weren't. No cause of death for Kerry and Francine could be ascertained, but duct tape was found suggesting they had been bound. A single bird-shaped earring was also found, but no clothing or any other personal belongings. Always just one earring is interesting to me, I'm pretty sure something's been taken as a trophy here. In 1975, the FBI issued a report stating that 14 unsolved homicides between 1972 and 1974 were all due to the same killer. That involved the six victims who had already been found and identified as of 1975, as well as 20-year-old Rosa Vasquez, 15-year-old Yvonne Quillantang, who was seven months pregnant at the time, 14-year-old Angela Thomas, 24-year-old Nancy Gidley, 22-year-old Nancy Pusey, 21-year-old Laura O'Dell, 19-year-old Brenda Merchant, and 14-year-old Donna Braun. All of these cases fitted the general MO of the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murder, although the causes of death do differ between strangulation and stabbing in a lot of these cases. Nancy Gidley was even found with a single gold earring. Despite the FBI report, these cases aren't often classed under the official victims of the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murders, but the names are occasionally linked. On the 1st of May 1975, the Hillsburg Tribune released the sheriff's psychological profile of the man they believe to be responsible for these crimes. It reads, he is a loser, a man in his early 30s with a history of mental instability, a man who enjoyed torturing animals as a child, a man who had a weak father and a dominant mother who he hated, a man who regards women as garbage. I mean, if you had a serial killer bingo card, this vague description would tick off a lot of them. The sheriff announced that he believed a single assailant was responsible for all of these murders. They've been playing with the idea of multiple assailants for a while, potentially due to the witness who saw somebody who looked like Laurie being dragged away by two men. I want to note again that two separate witnesses described a white man with an afro. Which I suppose brings us to some suspects here, and as is always the case with any unsolved murder in California in the 70s, investigators turned to their fail-safe suspect, the Zodiac. One detective suspected that the Zodiac's crimes were much more vast than anyone was aware. They suspected that the killer was leaving a trail of victims that formed the letter Z through California, Washington, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado. However, this theory was later dismissed when Ted Bundy was captured and many of the victims belonged to him and not the mysterious Zodiac. But the Z theory was just a small part of it, there were other things that pushed investigators to make this link. We remember the occult symbol found at the site of Caroline's death, formed on the ground with twigs. Well, we all know that the Zodiac was a fan of cryptic symbols and some people used that to link the two. But the most interesting link here is something that was proposed by Robert Graysmith in his book, Zodiac Unmasked. You might remember that Kim Allen was carrying a wooden soy barrel at the time that she disappeared. On this barrel were Chinese characters. 
Graysmith claims that there are similarities between those characters and an unknown symbol on the 29th of January 1974 Zodiac letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, known as the Exorcist Letter. In that letter, the Zodiac claims to have 37 victims, much more than the five people he is known to be responsible for. Graysmith thinks this is too much of a coincidence to ignore. Then, of course, there's a letter from November 1969 in which the Zodiac said he intended to switch up his MO. The Santa Rosa murders would begin just a couple of years later. But of course, we don't know who the Zodiac is and we won't have any further answers as to this until we do, if we ever do. But very closely linked to this theory is that of Arthur Lee Allen. Allen is one of the main suspects in the case of the Zodiac and in the Santa Rosa case. In fact, he was Robert Graysmith's favourite suspect. There's no denying that Allen was a creepy guy. He told his friend that he would like to kill people randomly and then taught the police with letters. And a surviving Zodiac victim picked him out from a lineup. There were many reasons as to why he was such a good suspect. However, his DNA didn't match evidence found at the scene, his handwriting didn't match, his fingerprints didn't match. But could he fit the Santa Rosa murderer better? We know that the majority of victims were underage girls, and in just 1968, Arthur Lee Allen was fired from a teaching job at a school after allegations of child molestation. He also lived in a trailer in Santa Rosa from 1971 to 1974, the exact years the killer was at large. No doubt he would have crossed paths with some of the victims. In his book, Graysmith even discusses potential forensic evidence that backs up this theory. They found hairs on some of the Santa Rosa victims that matched hairs found in the boot of Alan's car. These hairs turned out to be chipmunk hairs. Although it's not impossible that chipmunk hairs could be found on both due to unrelated reasons, some species are native to California and specifically the mountains around Santa Rosa, so that could be an explanation, but still a coincidence. On the note of well-known serial killers, there's also a Ted Bundy theory, his name coming to the forefront after his final capture in 1978. Bundy confessed to having been responsible for raping and killing at least 27 other women throughout the West, and he'd spent time in Marin County, which is right next to Santa Rosa. And of course, Bundy's MO wasn't a million miles away from what happened to these girls. Over the decades, detectives have come back to this theory time and time again, but each time Bundy has been ruled out. Credit card receipts prove that he was in the Northwest in Washington at the time that a lot of the murders were happening in Santa Rosa. But a 2011 article from the San Francisco Chronicle states that it's not impossible that he could have driven to Santa Rosa in days between the receipts. And Bundy drove a lot, sometimes driving hundreds of miles to kill a victim. I do think it's an easy way out to just blame Bundy for these crimes. He's been proven innocent way too many times of this to say it was him for certain. I think putting the blame of this on him would only absolve the actual perpetrator of their crimes. I personally don't think it was Bundy. The names of the Hillside Stranglers, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono Jr. have also been thrown around in relation to this case for obvious reasons. They operated in and around Los Angeles and strangled their victims before dumping their nude bodies on hillsides. Nine victims in total, ranging from 12 to 28 years old. They operated in the late 70s, and as far as I can see, they've never been serious suspects in the Santa Rosa case, although I'm unsure of why. But I'm sure this lead was followed as far as it could, and they found nothing. The final suspect here is a name that you probably haven't heard before, and that's Frederick Manali, a 41-year-old creative writing instructor at Santa Rosa Junior College, the very same college attended by Kim Allen. Manali died in a car accident in 1976, and whilst going through his things afterwards, his wife found several concerning drawings of some of his students, including Kim Allen. These drawings were sexual in nature and showed he had a deep fascination or perhaps obsession with sadomasochism. It seems that this guy was also considered to be a Zodiac suspect at one point. 
However, other than his clear obsession with Kim Allen, there's nothing else to tie him to the murders. Apart from the fact they suddenly seem to stop after his death. Or, of course, there's a very high likelihood that the killer was none of the men I just mentioned. It could have been literally anyone else. Maybe the killer was apprehended for another crime, perhaps they moved cities or changed MO, or maybe they got married and had kids and just didn't have time for their crimes anymore. Which does sound ridiculous, but that actually happens pretty often. Even serial killers don't have time for murdering when they've got kids and a family to keep. This is definitely one of the lesser known unsolved serial killer cases. I've seen people online saying they've lived in Santa Rosa their entire lives and have never even heard about this case before. But as with so many unsolved cases, the key to unlocking the answer is public awareness and DNA of course. After the success of using DNA and genealogy sites to capture the Golden State Killer, this same technique was deployed in many other similar cases including this one. There was DNA found in the form of semen at some of the crime scenes, so they do have his DNA. The evidence collected from Kim Allen's body is one of the strongest potential leads in this case. As of 2011, investigators have been trying to test it and other samples. Apparently, they actually really tried to see if there was a link to Ted Bundy, but that process stalled. And I assume they found no Bundy link. As of 2018, they were still working on this. And that's about all we've got up to this point. I have faith in DNA technology, I think that it is still possible to get solid answers in this case. The DNA testing might take some time, but bringing more awareness to this case can only help. Perhaps someone out there remembers something which they've never told the police. I'd be interested to know if any of my viewers are from Santa Rosa or the immediate area, and if you have any further insight into this case. Thank you so much for tuning in this week and I will see you next time. Bye guys.